the delay, I will proceed now to uh, our first debate and I would like to invite my co-chair, Maria Sanz de la Garz, who is from Hospital Clinic Barcelona and will chair together this uh, particular session. Now, I will start with a case that I'm going to present to you and then I will pose the question and then I will introduce our speakers. Uh, for this particular case, we've got two fantastic uh, uh, speakers debating. The pro-argument will be by Professor Christina Hoga, who is a professor of cardiology at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And the con-argument will be from uh, Professor Andre Lagers, who is a professor at the Baker Heart Institute at the University of uh, Melbourne. The way we're going to run it is that they will have about 12 to 15 minutes to present their case. And then we will repeat the poll to see if they manage to convince you to sway your opinion in regarding the particular case. And then we will have the opportunity to have a discussion so we can answer some of your questions as well. So let's get started. The first case is a 23-year-old white male. He's a recreational football player who does some running as well. And he was actually preparing for the London Marathon. He is completely asymptomatic with no significant past medical history or family history of note. And he attends one of the screenings organized by cardiac risk in the young. And as you can see from the ECG on your right, it looks quite abnormal with significant T-wave inversions from V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5, as well as the inferior leads and a left axis deviation. Now, we referred him for further evaluation, and unfortunately, his transthoracic echocardiogram revealed fairly dilated left ventric sorry, right ventricular cavity that is quite evident even in your parasternal long axis view, but even more so, you can see how large and dyskinetic the right ventricle is. Now, those findings were confirmed on the cardiac MRI, where he had enlarged right ventricular volumes with wall motion abnormalities and an ejection fraction of 40%, but no evidence of gadolinium enhancement as evidence of myocardial fibrosis. We proceeded to further investigations, which included a maximal exercise test, whereas you can see he did very well on a Bruce protocol, and he had a multifocal ventricular ectopy, and here I present to you an episode of non-sustained VT, which you can see on his Holter monitor as well, which seems to be predominantly of left bundle branch block with inferior axis. And on the Holter, he had a total of about 3,000 ventricular ectopic pits. So based on those findings, we attribute the diagnosis of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And we proceeded to genetic testing that identified the pathogenic variant in the placophilin 2 uh, gene. We went on to perform a family screening, and this is our individual. And as you can see, we identified the condition and the genetic variant in his father. His mother was negative, and then he's got a 16-year-old brother, and that's where I want us to concentrate, where he also had the variant. Now, the difference is that his brother was investigated comprehensively and all his investigations were unremarkable with no evidence of underlying cardiomyopathy. And he's uh, playing football for an elite academy and he has professional aspirations. So the debate question that our uh, speakers are going to debate is, would you clear this individual for competitive sport? And we will open the poll now, and I want you to put a yes or no. So would you clear this particular individual for competitive sport? And the reason why I decided to go on with that debate is because of the fact that the Guidelines currently say advise against participation even for genetic positive phenotype negative individuals, but in my clinical practice is an extremely difficult scenario to, uh, to negotiate in an individual who has no symptoms and nothing on clinical evaluation. So we'll leave you a few seconds 
and then we will uh, see the uh, results of uh, our poll. And I think you've got a few more seconds to try and say to us yes or no to that particular question. And I will write down the results and we'll see what happens once our gladiators had the opportunity to present uh, their case. So let's look at the results and what we've got here is, it's still moving a bit, so we'll let it for a second, but I think we've got a resounding no. So 62% say no compared to 38% that says a yes. So I'm not sure whose uh, challenge is more difficult on this particular case, but I would like to invite in the first instance Professor Christina Hoga to argue for the pro case. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, very nice uh, uh, introduction. Uh, Michael, I think it's the first time that I've ever been introduced as a gladiator, but uh, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> so um, I will... Um, uh, make the pro that he will not uh, he, that he should be that this is the end of the road. So we, what we know about arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is uh, that chronic endurance sport uh, leads to desmosomal stretch, and uh, the PKP2, as in our family member, which is the case, is um, uh, involved in the desmosome. So we know that uh, endurance sports is giving the uh, sudden death risk. But we don't know this for so very long. Uh, it was first time in 2006 that it was shown in uh, mice, in animal experience, that uh, there is a association between exercise and ARVC in placophilin 2. It was shown in uh, humans, first time by the Baltimore group, 87 ARVC patients and family members, that those who had uh, performed exercise had a higher likelihood of ARVC diagnosis and higher likelihood of ventricular arrhythmias. It was also shown that uh, in a study from our group, that in uh, 65 patients and 45 family members, exercise accelerates and aggravates ARVC disease, and that exercise was associated with RV dilatation and RV and LV dysfunction, also in separate analysis of the family members. Uh, we also know that these patients are very keen on doing sports, so they always ask us, can I do sport? And in this study uh, of uh, 91 probands and 82 family members, we can see that those who did high intensity, long duration sports had the highest likelihood of uh, uh, ventricular arrhythmias. And those who did low intensity of long duration even had, a very, uh, had the fewest events. So of these 173, 82 were mutation positive family members. And of these eight, in these 82, ventricular arrhythmias occurred in five of them, and all of them reported high and intensity exercise. This was also shown in a paper from the Baltimore group again, in 28 family members with PKP2 mutations, and those who developed VT or VF had performed particularly high intensity exercise in adolescence compared to unaffected family members. And if you look at these bar charts, the probands, of course, uh, had some uh, VTVF. And this is on the y-axis, you see the percentage of uh, endurance athletes. And the family members with VT or VF were those who had the, the most endurance athletes. So this group, they concluded that uh, these results favors restricting unaffected desmosomal mutation carriers from endurance and high intensity athletics. So how about, uh, what about the left ventricular function in ARVC? Uh, we showed in this study that in 168 ARVC patients with 648 observations, uh, and of these 84 were family members with mild disease, we could see that exercise was associated with worse LV function 
and with biventricular involvement, both in probands and in family members. So those with less exercise had a better LV function at start of the study than those with more exercise, but both progressed uh, similar, similarly during follow-up. Uh, my glad gladiator opponent, uh, Andrea Gersh, showed already in uh, 2012 that in healthy athletes, uh, endurance athletes, there was an exercise-induced right ventricular dysfunction and structure remodeling. So looking at these graphs, we could see that uh, this is the RV ejection fraction and this is the RV fractional area change, uh, that at base, after the run, after the exercise, there was a reduction in both RV ejection fraction and RV fractional area change, with which mostly um, uh, uh, reversed after, but not in all. A few athletes with long accumulated endurance sport had greater structural remodeling of the RV, and therefore RV abnormalities may be acquired through cu cumulative bouts of exercise in, uh, intense exercise. And the conclusion is that exercise induced RV structural abnormality also in healthy athletes. Furthermore, uh, Andre showed here uh, in 2012, together with Hein Heinbuchel, that there is a continuum between ARVC and exercise-induced ARVC, and they had the hypo hypothesis that when ARVC is the uh, truly with the weakened, weakened desmosomes, it might be that exercise-induced ARVC is due to excessive wall stress, which disrupts even normal desmosomes. So, and, uh, so exercise may induce arrhythmias and, uh, and um, reduce function even in healthy athletes. So this has given the theory of the double hit hypo hypothesis that you have a genetic predisposition here shown in red. And on top of the genetic predisposition, you add sports activity until you reach a point of no return or a threshold where you uh, develop an ARVC phenotype. If you have a weaker genetic predisposition, it might be that you need more sports activity to reach the threshold. And if you have a weak genetic predisposition, you need even more. And then there is not uh, finally concluded that if you have no genetic predisposition that you can also induce an ARVC phenotype. But however, we talk about a desmosomal reserve, which is not unlimited. The 2022 guidelines for sudden cardiac death and VT shows, uh, tell us that we should avoid high intensity exercise in definite ARVC patients, of course. And they have a 2B recommendation of avoidance of high intensity exercise also in carriers of ARVC related pathogenic mutations and new phenotype, like our case that Michael just presented. So I would like to summarize that exercise is acutely and long-term associated with increased risk of ventricular arrhythmias in ARVC patients and also in genotype positive family members. And exercise affects RV and LV dysfunction in long-term outcome, also in genotype positive family members with no or mild disease. And it seems like desmosomal dysfunction is a continuum from normal to mutated. And we have shown that excessive wall stress disrupts uh, even normal desmosomes. And therefore, we can conclude uh, or we can deduct that if you have a, not a normal desmosome, but you have a PKP2 mutated desmosome, this should be even more vulnerable. And uh, you should not stress this vulnerable desmosome. So my best advice for the 16-year-old PKP2 positive, so far phenotype negative family member who has aspirations uh, of a professional uh, football career, I would say this is the end of the road. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christina, and a very convincing argument. Now, let's see if uh, Andre can uh, bring the result uh, around. So next, uh, we've got Professor Andre Leggers, who will present the contra-argument to end of the road. 
and uh, allow the young individual to complete, compete uh, as a footballer. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Michael. You're able to see my slides. Always yes. a nervous moment in these. All right, let me start and I'm actually going to end with the disclaimer that um, in Australia it's uh, half past midnight. And also we had a farewell for a few colleagues at work. Um, so we had a few drinks. Uh, so despite that, I think that I quite clearly have the easier hand. Um, and so even with those um, disadvantages, I think that it's going to be easy to convince you that in 2022, in the era in the era of personalized medicine we don't need to make the binary decision of patient has mutation patient can't do sport and that there is a gradation in that decision making so as um christina pointed out it's somewhat strange for me to be debating this side of or taking this position in the debate because i spent my phd a bit more than 10 years ago uh, assessing this topic and looking at, at the wall stress during exercise. So we put catheters and imaging in, and we um, deduced that right ventricular wall stress increased around 120% and left ventricular wall stress around 20% during exercise. And during intense endurance exercise, as Christina pointed out, we saw acute right ventricular failure that increased with duration of exercise. And from that, deduce that exercise that you could arrive at an ARVC phenotype by either having weak desmosomes, you know, the kind of glue between the myocytes so they could be defective, or you could just overstretch them with a hemodynamic stress. And this concept, now this is where I really want to launch off because this was a concept that we had deduced from people doing extreme um, intense endurance exercise, Ironman competitions and the like, who were training 30 hours or, or more a week, 20, 30 hours of intense exercise a week. And in those people, we saw troponin elevations, RV dysfunction and the like, and, um, and surmised also on the background of some of Hein Heidbuchel's work showing in elite cyclists, particularly that we saw um, right ventricular arrhythmia. So in the most extreme athletes, we would see these changes. And I just really need to point out that exercise is not a binary thing. All of these studies talk about athletes and non-athletes as if there's two types of people in this world. Um, ath athletic participation is a spectrum. Here's a 24-year-old librarian, 25-year-old Socceroo, our national football team, and a 23-year-old professional cyclist. In one, you have, an, uh, you have a normal EDV and stroke volume, in the footballer, a slight increase, and in the professional cyclist, a massive increase in both EDV, around 300 mils, and stroke volume, 180 mils, and as a result, a quite extreme bradycardia. So the more sport you do, the more endurance sport you do, the more remodeling, and presumably, uh, when you have a desmosomal um, mutation, as is the topic here, then in these extreme endurance exercise, you're creating the greater stress. But do we need to exclude all of these people? Where do we draw the line? And as Christina pointed out, uh, this is the data from Johns Hopkins, and it clearly shows that athletes have a faster progression of their disease. But again, what is an athlete? If you look at this paper, the definition of an athlete is uh, a little bit opaque. And if we look at the literature, across all studies, there's a variable, inconsistent and non-clear definition of what constitutes an athlete. So for a start, where do we go just with that simple thing? And I just want to bring it back to the case as well, because to start with, and I'm sure that this has been well established, but we really want to be absolutely sure of the diagnosis. And I think that the case presented was a crystal clear diagnosis of ARVC, but then you want to be absolutely sure that the variant identified is indeed a pathogenic variant. We didn't have a lot of information on that, but there's only so much time. But um, the PKP2 um, gene is one in which we see a lot of variants. And so we want to see segregation. And here we have some evidence of segregation uh, in, that the, in that the patient's father also apparently has a positive phenotype and has, shares the same gene. So it suggests that this, um, that this variant pathological variant in the 16 year old footballer we should pay attention to but 
what if this phenotype is ambiguous? It really would be nice to be able to confirm in the father's two siblings and, and get a very a, an even clearer idea of segregation if we were approaching this clinically. But let's take that for given and say that this footballer, indeed, we should be paying a lot of attention to this mutation. And I come back to the, the, this evidence of what do we do with the genopositive phenotype negative. And in this um, initial small population of patients with that group, there's a clear difference, again, between those people who are endurance athletes who tended to develop the um, diagnosis with ARVC task force criteria versus those who were not endurance athletes. We're talking about a 15-year-old footballer and would not be classified as an endurance athlete. So, in fact, his risk of developing ARVC by TFC would probably be more correctly assigned to this lower probability group. Again, we need to consider that not all athletes are created equal. What if we divide it into quartiles of exercise? So in this group, they had divided up into those at presentation who are in the top quartile of exercise and the lowest, and then during follow-up, how much exercise was done. And in those people who did the, the um, in the lowest three quartiles, um, there was a low incidence, no matter what you presented with, there was a relatively low incidence of of, of serious ventricular arrhythmias. Whereas if you exercised in the top quartile, then, um, then the risk was, was significant. Now, again, the, if we were to, to look at what they defined as the, as the top quartile, it was around about 10 hours of, of moderate or intense exercise a week. Our experience with club footballers, um, both Australian rules and international rules, is that most, most uh, exercise performed is less than 10 hours per week, more around eight hours per week. So again, this particular athlete, you wonder whether they need to be thrown in the you can't compete category. Here's some further data where they tried to put some sort of measurement and, and found that if people were doing two and a half hours of, of exercise per week, that they had a very low incidence of developing ventricular arrhythmias. And in fact, in those statistically significant comparisons, you had to do four to five times the, this amount of exercise. So again, somewhere up around 10 hours of vigorous exercise per week, that sort of amount that we would consider for endurance athletes, which this soccer player is not. And Christina's own data, and this is a mix of both um, patients who had a task force criteria diagnosis and those who had a genopositive diagnosis, so if we were to just look at those people like the particular patient that we're talking about with without any phenotypic features, then in this quadru quadrant where he sits with the high intensity short duration, it's likely to top out at 52%, but with no features of ARVC, probably should be substantially less. And yet we're assigning him to not being able to do sport for the rest of his life. Now, things get a little bit more complex here, but bear with me a little bit. So this is the concept that we, um, that we came up with of, of what we called exercise-induced ARVC with our um, endurance athletes uh, who, who met task force criteria of, of ARVC. And we did genotyping and only a small, around 12% of the athletes had a genotype that was likely or pathogenic um, a, a desmosomal mutation. And those who did not have a mutation did a lot more exercise. This was beautifully validated, almost exactly the same results coming from Johns Hopkins five years later. Again, those who they called gene elusive, but the common feature was they did stacks of exercise, as you can see, met ours here, massively more than those who had um, a desmosomal gene mutation. Now, the reason I want to highlight that is then if we look at the effect of taking away exercise, so we're treating these people by restricting exercise, then it's those people who are mutation negative, and I just showed you that those people who are mutation negative are those people who did the most exercise. In those people who do the most exercise, you take it away and their ARVC progresses less quickly. So that makes perfect sense to me. For people who are caught, who their disease is caused by lots and lots of exercise, if you restrict them, then we see improve, well, improvements or stabilisation in the disease. Conversely, people like the person that we're talking about in this case, who's doing less than 10 hours of exercise a week, 
then take that away and the impact's going to be modest. Now, the other thing is we're talking about an athlete who's mutation positive in whom taking away the sport doesn't seem to even make an appreciable difference. This strange paradox that, that um, being gene mutation, in fact, may have a lesser or exercise may have a lesser effect. And we need to consider the offsets. And this is very clear. You take exercise away from a 15-year-old person and you expose him to the risks of sedentary behaviour, um, which, which is probably the worst prognosis against all other risk factors, not to mention the huge psychological burden. So two, two lots of conclusions. The first, exercise is, is a spectrum. And I just want to make that point again and again. Risk is greatest in those who are doing the, the largest volume of intense endurance exercise. And conversely, exercise restriction is of greatest benefit in those people doing the most exercise. Exercise guidelines are binary. We don't live in a binary world um, and it shouldn't be just so simplistic as excluding everyone. We should be assessing how much exercise people do, assessing disease severity. Remember variable penetrance, meaning that some people who are gene positive will never dis express the disease and yet here we would be excluding them. Um, this concept that exercise restriction may even be less important in those like the person we're talking about who's gene positive and we clearly need to benefit to balance the restrictions versus the, the cardiometabolic and psychological risk. So I would conclude that that sh certainly should not necessarily be the end of the road for all. Now, Wonderful. thank you very much, Andre. And uh, uh, before we proceed, what I would like to do now is put the question back to uh, our audience. So uh, you've got exactly the same question to ask. So would you clear this 16 year old individual who is essentially phenotype negative, genotype positive, although Andre tried to share some doubt in terms of his genotype, uh, but would you clear him for competitive sports? So uh, again, just go at the bottom of your screen and try to reply uh, uh, yes or, or no. Okay, and we'll give you a bit of time and we'll see uh, how the, the result uh, uh, pans out. So we had before 38 versus 62. 62 was no, 38 was yes. And we'll see if that has changed at all. And then we will move on to some brief rebuttals and to our next debate. Please remember that at the very end of the session, we will have a discussion regarding both debates. So please go on and put your questions, queries, and we will put them to our, uh, to our uh, speakers towards the end of the session. It seems pretty similar to me. <laughs> Can I just have a few sympathy votes? Come on, it's, it's well past midnight in Australia. <laughs> Throw me a bit of sympathy here. <laughs> uh, I think that, that's what this is. <laughs> okay, so we just leave it at that. So we've got 59 to 41. So, uh, well, not actually. <laughs> Andre, I'm afraid it's exactly the same, 62% to 38%. So it's exactly as we started. Okay, let's stop that. And uh, Christina, just a couple of minutes to uh, have a bit of a rebuttal to what Andre put forward, and then we'll give the same opportunity to Andre. Yes, very nice, uh, Andre. I liked your presentation. And I also like that you said it's not the end of the road for all, because that is a modification uh, than to say that everybody should go, because that would be uh, a very special thing to say. Uh, so I'm happy for that. And uh, I wanted just to remind you that uh, you made a point that uh, 10 hours of exercise a week is the golden cutoff. I'm not totally agree with that, because uh, both the Baltimore group and also my own group have shown uh, differences in um, in outcome with much lower exercise levels. So the Baltimore group, I think, was two hours, two and a half hours a week, and we had four hours a week above six METs as a cutoff. Uh, and these also these lower cutoffs showed clear um, differences in outcome when doing exercise, and also for the family members. So, so the strict 10 hours rule, I don't know exactly where that uh, came from. And my second argument is that our case, the young man, 
he had elite football aspirations and I don't think that he will limit if he is going to be cleared for doing this exercise I'm not sure that he's going to limit himself to 10 hours so uh, I, I'm sorry I will just keep my strict uh, end of the road vote thank you thank you very much Christina and Andre can I, I'm actually, I'm just going to jump back into my, uh, can, are you able to see my slides again? I'm sure we can arrange that. Yep. Okay. So I, I've got to go back to my drinking tonight, actually, because <laughs> whilst we were at the pub saying farewell, the, 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 the legal counsel at our institution, John, said, said, I said, I had to go off and do this lecture tonight after midnight. And he said, I should be doing that for you. I said, John, you don't know anything about ARVC. He said, no, 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 you don't. The, the way the law works, we don't know anything about anything. We just get a brief over two hours and then we do a better job representing it than you. So I gave him a brief over about 30 minutes and this was his summary of everything. He said, in, in, in his own words, he said, Honourable Christina, <laughs> my, 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 my colleague, you want to take this 15 year old with no crimes, he couldn't say ARVC or desmosomal mutation. So he just used the word, the analogy crimes for, for phenotype. So he's got no crimes and you're going to give him a life sentence because he resembles a criminal. He's got some genetic features that might be the same as some other people who might have committed a crime versus, versus allowing him to be a free man, your honor provide sensible modifying guidance and, and wait to see if he develops even the slightest hint of becoming a criminal and then doing something about it. And so it was pretty compelling. And I thought that he, uh, that that would actually um, have carried the case in a court of law. But if I could be a little bit serious for a second, um, I, I just want to, I, I want to make the point and not leave people with, with um, any ridiculous comments. And I, that 10 hour cutoff was a little bit for the sake of the debate. I don't really agree with that myself. I think, though, what I would encourage people to do is, as the evidence evolves, is to be a little bit um, critical of some of our data and everyone's data about how we quantify exercise, because at the moment, we all do it badly. And every one of those studies was using a questionnaire. We've recently um, done a lot of work with bioinformaticians using their own um, exercise data from watches, etc. And the correlation between real recorded data and questionnaire is appalling. It really is. And we're, and we're relying on very poor metrics in an era now where people can tell you exactly how often they exercise, what intensity, etc. And we're developing some tools to collect that. And I think it's really going to be critical because we're making life decisions on these people based on data that's a little bit finger in the wind. And, and the challenge I would say to everyone listening and ourselves is to actually get much better than this. You know, we don't take a person who's had a heart attack and say, look, cholesterol contributed to this. So you're never allowed to eat any cheese, have any milk, have any dairy fat. Anything that resembles cholesterol is off the plate. Whereas with exercise, we're treating it as some absolute and, and we need to be better at measuring it. We need to be better at um, understanding its impact. And then we need to be much more graded in the recommendations that we make. With the evidence that we have right now, to be perfectly honest, I agree with Christina's position. I think that the right position to start with, with an athlete um, who's gene positive would be to tell them they should be restricting their sport. But I think the day will come when we can be more um, personalised in our recommendations. Thank you very much, both. Uh, we will have lots of time for questions and to, because our audience is putting questions on. But can I just briefly ask you, since we've got time, so uh, Andre, if we let him compete, then how would you arrange his follow-up? What would you do in terms of monitoring, so on and so forth? What would be the, the, the in practical terms, what exactly would you do for yeah. our audience? So it's actually an incredibly important question. And, and despite, because I have to be a bit careful, because some of the things that I said in the debate, I don't 100% agree with. And, and, and I think that the process of trying to follow someone, because one thing you could say is, look, you can go and do what you like, and we'll watch you really closely. And when we start to see some problems, then we'll start restricting. I have made the mistake of doing similar to that 
earlier in my career. And I don't believe that our tools are good enough. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you're following them. In fact, you're probably following them too often. You don't see the interval change. They start developing ventricular arrhythmias and, you, and you're upset with yourself. So I do believe that we need to follow them closely. We need to follow them with echo and intermittently with MRI. My own personal practice is to include exercise and exercise imaging because I think it does increase the sensitivity of that testing. But I don't completely agree with what I said, which is that you can wait for those changes to start making recommendations. I think that's a risky strategy. Hmm. And Christina, what would be your practice if you, well, if he were to continue or if he were to be restricted, what, what would you advise him in terms of what do we mean by restriction, first of all, for that particular individual? And secondly, what would be your follow up for that uh, young individual with a family history? Actually, I also must admit that I uh, agree uh, this, to some extent with Andrea. <laughs> I think he said very clever things. Uh, uh, so I would say that low intensity exercise is absolutely allowed for this uh, young man because it's too tough to say that no exercise. That's uh, that's it's not a binary thing. So low intensity exercise, I think they can do even for long duration. And as, as our, our data showed, it was the high intensity, even of short duration, which was the most harmful. Long, uh, low intensity exercise you could do for even long duration. So I, say, I used to say to the patients, and I would have said to this young man that you can do, you can go, you can do brisk walking, you can go mountain walks, you can do, which is very popular in Norway, of course, uh, but you should just avoid the high intensity things. Soccer, football is high intensity. That is not, that for sure you should avoid, but everything else you can do. You can my, maybe even do light jogging. So um, to, to give them some, uh, to not do, I did, I, I like this, uh, your honor thing, that, that the life sentence for uh, <laughs> doing no sports, that's not correct. That's not right. Uh, low intensity. You see, and he wanted us to feel sorry for him, but it was actually the drinks that won him the debate. Sorry, go on, Andre. I was just going to add the other thing that I feel confident in allowing patients to do, there's not much evidence on this, but based on hemodynamics is, is weight training, not circuit sort of CrossFit stuff, but just some strength because often with young patients, if you sort of say, you know, because I agree, well, I say to people, if you do it low intensity, you can do it all day, every day, you know, it, it's, it's, um, but I add to that that weight training because it, it is sort of something to give back. And, and I'm pretty convinced that that doesn't have any of that sort of wall stress type mm. remodeling that we see with um, endurance exercise. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, what I think we'll do, we'll stop here now and I'll pass on to Maria to introduce our second debate. And then we'll bring both of you together with our second uh, uh, debate speakers and we can go through all the questions that our audience has.